I'm not sure how many know this, but coach Eric Nixick of Extreme Couture near perfectly predicted Alex Pereira's path to victory in their first MMA fight. Quoting from an exceptional series of written content for UFC.com done by E. Spencer Kite, At a time in the sport where everyone is pretty solid everywhere, generally speaking, what is the one thing that each of these competitors do better than anyone else? Nixick. Izzy's best trait for me is his feint game. When you watch him in between segments, he's doing so much with his feints, his eyes, his body language, his rhythm, and there's a lot to it. It's almost like a conductor that is finding the openings for where each instrument goes, and it's beautiful to watch. That's his absolute best attribute. When asked about how Pereira needed to fight Israel, Nixick had this to say. The main thing that he's really going to have to do is find smart ways to cut the cage off and try to put Izzy in the flat part of the panel and guide him into the two corner posts by eliminating some of Izzy's 45 degree backwards movements or his straight backs. It gives him only perpendicular movements to the right or the left. If you cut the door off on either side and say, hey, here's your exit, you know which way he's going to go, and it's either move that way or he has to shoot. So you either make him panic wrestle from there or you shut the door, show him the exit, and that's when you can set up some of those power shots and try to take his head off. I only read this after the first fight, and the prophetic predictions Nixick made absolutely blew me away. I had to know what he saw. As an aside, in college I took a course on the neuroscience of language, where a fascinating hypothesis was introduced called the Sapir Whorf Hypothesis. If you have seen the movie Arrival or read the short story it is based on, then you have a conceptual understanding of the concept. The hypothesis suggests that the structure of a language influences its speaker's worldview or cognition, and thus individuals' language determine or shape their perceptions of the world. This is also referred to as linguistic relativity. Simply, the way you structure how you view the world affects the way you perceive events. Sapir Whorf is about how the language you know affects perceptions of reality. So we need to alter that to an MMA standpoint. I'm going to call it the MMAI hypothesis because I am incredibly vain. The MMAI hypothesis. The way a coach structures their training determines how they analyze fights. So what did Nick succeed? All became clear when I purchased his tremendous instructional. All UFC fights are contested within an octagon. Eight columns connected by flat steel cage panels adding up to 30 feet in diameter. But crucially, the structure of the octagon creates an interesting geometry problem that Nixick and company solved. As an octagon, each column possesses two panels of cage arranged at 135 degree angles. An important thing to keep in mind, the vast majority of MMA striking arts build their angles off of 90 degree or 45 degree angles to create counter angles. Remember before when Nixick talked about the way Israel escaped pressure. The main thing that he's really going to have to do is find smart ways to cut the cage off and try to put Izzy in the flat part of the panel and guide him into the two corner posts by eliminating some of Izzy's 45 degree backwards movements or his straight backs. So with a conceptual understanding of the system's ideology out of the way, let's dive into the actual applications of this knowledge. Let's start at the beginning. The mission control, if you will. Everything in Nixick's system starts with taking the center of the cage. Dan Ige is one of the most practiced in Nixick's system, so I'm going to use him for many of our examples, as well as Kai Kamaka, another gifted practitioner. Ige particularly likes to use a floating hook that he rotates around. The punch isn't expressly to land, but rather functions as bait for the opponent to react to, while Ige re-maneuvers behind it. He also uses jab pivots to isolate opponents and give him the same opportunity to maneuver behind the strike he had with the hook. Our third example is this sort of lancing jab that isn't really meant to land but rather to occupy the opponent's eyes, much like that earlier hook, to retake the center. The other major way he creates room to take the center is throwing explosive combinations like the following you see on screen that are meant to dislodge opponents from their stationary stance to create a bit of discord where he can look to assume a more central position. A variation on this is when Ige has his back directly linear to the posts. If you think about it geometrically, if Ige advances straight forward rapidly, he can assume the direct center of the cage if that space is given to him. Ige will also side saddle his way to the center, just like most fighters, but this is energy inefficient, so tactics like the hook are used more often. Now what do they do when they have established central control? From there, it is all about using strikes to maneuver opponents backwards towards the corner and flat parts of the cage. Kai Kamaka's fight with Kevin Baum 
was a masterclass in his own application of the Nixic system's fundamentals. But there's one problem, right? Kamaka fights in Bellator, which uses a circle instead of an octagon. This should eliminate the system's effectiveness due to the lack of angles, right? As we see, the simple answer is no. The more complicated answer will require me to do some calculus to find the derivative of Bohm's exits, and that's too much math for MMA. Before this turns into a calculus lecture, let's move on to the final piece of the system's fundamentals, when they have the opponent directly backed to the fence. I'm going to re-quote Nick Sick in that Pereira breakdown. If you cut the door off on either side and say, hey, here's your exit, you know which way he's going to go, and it's either move that way or he has to shoot. Show him the exit, and that's when you can set up some of those power shots and try to take his head off. I think it's going to be very, very important for Pereira to eliminate some of the movement by backing him up to the barrier. As we have outlined so far with Nixic system fighters, strikes are often used to purely maneuver opponents and create opportunities for funneling. Like we saw with Kamaka vs. Bohm, Pereira absolutely destroys Izzy's legs with calf kicks and then pounces on the range Israel gives up defensively. Pereira is essentially just using calf kicks and body jabs to steadily inch Israel backwards while hampering his escapes due to the leg damage. This is much simpler than the multitude of ways Nixic outlined for backing up fighters to the cage in his instructional, but hey, it worked. As the fight progresses and Israel's legs become further and further damaged, he is really unable to re-maneuver himself the way he needs to in order to avoid Pereira's funneling techniques. Finally, in the fifth round, the bell tolls for Izzy. Alex has boxed Israel into the corner of the cage. His stance is leaving the exit open towards Alex's lead hand side. Israel begins to head that direction, but his movement is noticeably hampered while Alex jabs to enter. Remember what Nixick said, if you cut the door off on either side and say, hey, here's your exit, you know which way he's going to go, and it's either move that way or he has to shoot. While not technically shooting on Alex, he is following the spirit of Nixick's analysis by reaching for collar ties as he has done successfully in this fight repeatedly. I will break down those collar ties deeper later in this video. Israel's hands are out of position, and the hammer hits the anvil. The rest is set in stone at this point. Now, of course, going into that second fight, I had very little confidence in Adesanya's chances. If you listen to my preview post on Patreon, I outline everything I have told you about thus far, and couldn't figure out a solution to Alex's use of Nixic system. Pereira's use of the calf kick heightened the problem that the Nixic system is built to exploit. By hampering your opponent's mobility while tactically applying your own, you are steadily heading towards a disaster, right? To defend the calf kick, Izzy will have to be light on his lead leg and constantly thinking about checking. This, in turn, devotes his attention away from defending kicks to the head and fainted entries to power hooks. To me, that's near insurmountable odds. Either get your leg kicked off or your consciousness taken. But there's a reason Adesanya is coached by some of the best minds in MMA and not me because they cracked it by using an implicit tenet of the Nixic system ideology that it only realized after rewatching the instructional after the fight. Like last time, Pereira came out heavy with attacks to Israel's calf, bashing it over and over and over. While Pereira has adapted to the last fight's tactics some, he is largely employing the same game plan as before. Then, everything changes. If you think about it from a first principles perspective, Nixic's system at its foundation is a balance between deception and maneuverability. His fighters have a location they want to get to with a number of tools at their disposal to get there and hide their intentions. Ige used those punches to get the opponent focused on one thing while he maneuvers. When you have the opponent back to the corner, you maneuver to show exits with traps set to exploit their choice. In that sense, the deceived opportunity of maneuver is the key, right? You're showing them an exit, but there really isn't one there. Pereira has now in this fight, much like their last, steadily beaten away Adesanya's capacity to maneuver before eventually backing him into the corner of the cage. Pereira is clearly giving Adesanya the exit towards his power left hook. Pereira doesn't even wait for the movement and rips the hook to where Adesanya should be, but he isn't. Izzy fainted the exit, causing Alex to overcommit to that hook. While Pereira is steadily moving laterally, Izzy helps him along with a jab inside powered by Izzy bouncing off the cage wall, followed by a right hand from Israel's pocket that lands cleanly through Pereira's chin. Ask yourself this, where is Pereira standing? As we have seen with Kamaka, where your hips are pointing is where the exit is, right? Pereira's hips are pointing into the corner of the octagon as Nixick would want, but he's way too close to Adesanya. 
From Adesanya's perspective, where are Pereira's hips pointing him to? Alex gave him the exit, didn't he? It just happened to be right through his hanging chin. But this wasn't a fluke. Pereira has been doing this in both fights now. All the way back to the end of the first round of their first fight we must go. Three seconds left. Alex has Izzy backed to near the corner. Izzy takes a step forward and throws a jab. Alex stays stationary and it lands relatively harmlessly, but Israel holds it there for a beat. Then rips a right hand behind it that stuns Pereira. What did Alex do wrong? He didn't maintain his range, and this sticking jab two combo punishes that. Where are his hips pointed? Straight through Israel, right? And conversely, right through his chin again. Let's rewind a bit earlier in this round to three minutes left. Izzy steps in for a fainted jab with a power straight behind it that hits Pereira hard. Pereira was ripping a leg kick concurrently, so the off balance was more about weight distribution than getting stunned. But the opportunity was there again, right? 349 of the second, hips pointed through Izzy, throws the lead hook, but isn't funneling him towards it, right? Conversely, at 304 of the second, look at where Pereira's hips are pointing. Izzy faints his way out, though. 256 of the second, same setup as the later knockout. Pereira's hips pointed to lead Israel to the lead hook. Pereira rips the hook while Izzy reaches for the collar tie. But importantly, that right hand stayed home defending his chin. Alex's overcommitted footwork and inconsistent hip placement are the ultimate undoing of his ability to consistently funnel the way Nixick's system is built to do. So what did Izzy do in their second fight? He drew Alex to the fence, waited until he overcommitted to the range and misplaced his hips, then threw the same sticking jab two combo that worked before, except this time he had the better angle and the time needed to finish the job. I highlight these fights and Nixick's system because first off, they're cool as fuck, but also because I feel like one of the most important things lost in pre-fight debates is the coaching perspective. Before every pay-per-view, E. Spencer Kite sits down with coaches of various disciplines to talk about what they see in fights. Most of the UFC's broadcast team are former slash current fighters, right? Bisping, DC, Laura Sanko, Michael Chiesa, etc., etc. One of my favorite parts of any pay-per-view is when Trevor Whitman comes on and gives his perspective as a coach. It always makes me notice odd things here or there that I'm missing. The coach's job is mainly in the gym, but they also have an overlooked portion of their job, right? Cornering. In a sense, isn't the job of the corner to see what the fighter is missing, and by proxy, the audience too? Most of the UFC broadcast is telling me what is happening. Insights like Nixick's pre-fight, and I imagine during the fight, would have been about what one or both fighters are missing. If you go back through the first and second Pereira fights, notice how little room Pereira leaves when he is shutting that door Nixick talks about. That opportunity Adesanya used to knock out Pereira was there all the way back to the beginning of the first fight. It was the coaches that noticed it and built a plan to enact on the biggest stage possible. I think that's pretty amazing. Now I've only scratched the surface of Nixick's system in this video. There is so much more just waiting to be discovered. If you are interested, I highly recommend you check out his instructional, which I have linked to in the description. Give it five stars as well so more people can find it and give Nixick his due. If you are watching this live and before 293, I have released a podcast breaking down the Strickland vs. Adesanya matchup that I have also linked to in the description. And hey, go check out E. Spencer Kite's new piece on 293. It's truly exceptional work and not enough people talk about it. I have also linked to it in the description below.